Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our 30th live event for iJerry Care. Uh, I'm joined again today by co founder Dr. Richard Stramko, geriatrician from McMaster University and Hamilton Health Sciences. And today's topic is probably a, an under discussed issue of alcohol related cognitive impairments and alcohol related dementia. So uh, I want to thank Dr. Stramko for joining us this afternoon uh, to talk about this important and maybe underemphasized issue. How are you doing, Richard? I'm doing great, Anthony. Great to be here this afternoon. Hope you're doing well. Thank you very much. Doing fine. So, um, so when we talk about alcohol-related cognitive changes or alcohol-related dementia, you know, we're usually talking about um, the effects of excess alcohol consumption, often in the in the context of a what we call an alcohol use disorder where, uh, you know, usually a lengthy time period, at least several years have accumulated of heavy drinking. And um, we, we think of this as leading to uh, damage to the brain and basically increasing your risk of developing dementia, as well as other types of cognitive issues. So um, when, as we've often talked about and, and we talk about in the IGRI care lessons, uh, dementia is a, a syndrome or an umbrella term that can have many different causes, such as Alzheimer's disease, uh, Parkinson disease, dementia, vascular dementia. So one of those causes um, related to substance use is alcohol uh, as the cause of dementia. Um, so with that as a bit of an intro, we're going to do a, a little bit of a deeper dive. Um, as always, uh, this will be recorded so you can come back and watch later. Um, please feel free to submit any questions or comments. You can do that uh, using the form. If you're watching it through Facebook Live, you can send in your questions or comments there. Or if you're watching it through the igericare.ca slash event site, uh, you can submit your questions through there or email them. Um, so uh, let's get started. And, um, you know, Rich, maybe start off by talking a little bit about what, what is the range that we see of kind of alcohol related cognitive disorders? It's a great question. I think taking even one step back is uh, just understanding that alcohol is quite toxic to all of our nerve cells. And it's a bit of a challenging one to reconcile just because alcohol use is so prevalent and it's enjoyable and it's culturally accepted. But um, even low dose exposure for periods of time can cause problems. And in particular, if you have high doses, uh, nerve cells throughout the body, so the brain can be impacted. A small part of the brain called the cerebellum that is responsible for coordination can be impacted. Your um, peripheral nerves, so the things that let you know, you know, if your body's experiencing pain or pressure or, or various things, temperature. Uh, so all aspects of the nervous system can be involved. So as you said, if you have high levels of exposure for a period of time, the alcohol can cause um, sometimes permanent damage and sometimes reversible damage. So when we're talking about alcohol related dementia, generally it's thought to be the direct toxic effects of alcohol on the brain over a period of time, which is different from uh, vitamin deficiencies that are associated with um, alcohol consumption or secondary liver problems related to alcohol consumption as well if the toxicity is exerted on the liver first. So instead of Alzheimer disease, where we might see that um, beta amyloid plaques that accumulate and shrinkage of the brain when we cut the brain open and look at it you don't really see much in alcohol related dementia generally what you'll see is just a shrinkage of the white matter generally as a whole and people may present with um, significant executive function problems people may also present with neuropsychiatric symptoms depression apathy irritability uh, and occasionally frontal lobe problems such as impulse control um, challenges as well. So that's kind of one side of it is the direct toxic effects of the alcohol. And then commonly in hospitalized populations, which you and I tend to see a lot of, we're worried about thymine related uh, deficiencies, which is, vit which is um, vitamin B1. You can get uh, B12 deficiency and B6 or pyridoxine deficiency, but that's much less common. 
than uh, thiamine deficiencies, which can um, present with two syndromes or clinical syndromes that we would see. And one is uh, Wernicke's encephalopathy, where people will have um, significant challenges with coordination, uh, sorry, uh, confusion. So they'll be confused when they come into hospital, they may have significant problems with coordination as well, and uh, specific eye findings. So um, they may have something called nystagmus, where their eyes kind of, their movements of their eyes are abnormal, and they may have inability to move their eyes. And that's um, related to the thymine deficiency. And if it progresses and becomes severe enough, um, people will have what's called anterograde amnesia, where they can't form new memories, and they actually will start confabulating or making up stories that have uh, not taken place, um, and that's called uh, uh, Korsakoff's. So once you get to the course, I mean, I, I think in the, in those last uh, in this introductory five minutes, you've you've said so much that uh, I want us to like unpack each sure. of these things. And yeah. so I think, um, you know, the first thing that you outlined, which I think was excellent, was that, you know, as a as a public health kind of issue or a preventative issue, there's an important concept related to uh, low risk drinking, uh, because it, it, there may be uh, some risk associated with any drinking and as much as it may be culturally accepted in certain cultures and, you know, a common issue for some people, um, you know, alcohol may be harmful. And we actually do have our lesson on promoting brain health and the WHO and others have recognized that actually um, alcohol use is a significant risk factor for the development of dementia, typically in excess, though there might be some people who are more vulnerable to the effects of, of alcohol and other ones. So I think that's a whole, a whole category that is sort of separate from you know, alcohol related cognitive impairments, but a really important thing that we can, we can, we should be mindful about the risks associated with alcohol and uh, the ways in which uh, we might be able to promote our brain health and possibly prevent dementia uh, by limiting alcohol consumption and other lifestyle factors. So that's one side of things. Then uh, I'm just going to share uh, a few slides that we can walk through some of the other key points that you made around some of the uh, understanding, I guess, of alcohol-related uh, cognitive impairments. So, you know, the one thing that you mentioned is that uh, as, as we understand it, alcohols may have a direct toxic effect on, on the brain structures as well as function, although I think that's less well understood. But we do know that alcohol seems to cause this effect, as you mentioned, that, you know, pro, pro, Prolonged alcohol use over several years, uh, heavy use, uh, will cause brain atrophy or shrinkage. Is that is that right? And it, and it seems to be a direct toxic effect of alcohol on the brain and and other nerve cells, which we'll talk about in a sec. Absolutely, and uh, it it differs in that instead of seeing these accumulation of protein substances, the toxic proteins we've mentioned before, or accumulation of vascular damage. The only thing you're really seeing is the, the shrinkage of the white matter, which is different from the other dimensions we usually talk about when the gray matter is what starts to atrophy first and showing focal atrophy patterns or shrinkage. Okay. The one thing that is kind of interesting as well is, you know, uh, one of the pieces of advice that we will give to people with uh, alcohol related cognitive impairments or dementia is still to. Um, abstain from alcohol use because there is sometimes a component of damage that is reversible. So uh, I guess the thing that when somebody does present uh, with cognitive impairments that meet the criteria for dementia, and we are trying to help them, like we don't have any treatments that reverse uh, Alzheimer's, for example. Uh, but, you know, in the same way that we recommend you know, improving blood vessel health in somebody who has vascular dementia, there are things you can do to reduce your consumption or abstain from alcohol use. And one that may help to prevent further progression of alcohol related cognitive damage. And in some cases, there may be still some component of the damage that is reversible. 
And I think we're seeing here too with this list, the multi-system nature of it. And I think that's what some people will not appreciate as much as, um, you know, people will regard alcohol use disorder or previously called, you know, alcoholism as um, something that's not really related to them or something that happens to people when they're younger. But we run into quite frequently people that encounter very stressful situations or grief or loss that are associated with aging, like loss of a spouse or loss of a child. Um, retirement can actually cue it off in a lot of people when they're used to being engaged and now they're kind of bored um, around the house. They don't might not have hobbies. It's actually quite common for people to develop alcohol use disorder late in life, or if it's not full-blown use disorder, it's problem drinking he heavy drinking heavy and, enough yeah. to cause issues yeah and i i think we've seen you know a lot of people uh drinking more during the pandemic as well so that's another good example uh, i feel like we tend to underdiagnosed alcohol use disorder in older adults and it's exactly that population that's also at higher risk of dementia and the notion of even combination of, you know, more than one cause that could be contributing to cognitive impairment. So, you know, really important for uh, people, if you're meeting with, uh, you know, care providers and doctors for an assessment of cognitive impairment, um, as the patient or the care partner, uh, it would be really important to be honest about uh, your drinking history as, as one component of the cognitive assessment. Um, the thing I would say just to kind of discuss more general use in the context of other dementias as well is that, you know, there's just, if you drink a small amount of alcohol, your cognitive capacity could be impaired. And then obviously you drink more and you're, there's full uh, intoxication related to it. Um, it also impacts your sleep and sleep impacts your cognition. So it um, causes problems with sleep related architecture. You may think that you've had a good night's sleep mm -hmm. because you were unconscious, but the quality of the sleep was not restorative. And so there's kind of that component of it where you were talking about abstaining or decreasing consumption in the context of all kind of cognitive disorders. And then the other um, side of it is, there seems to be almost like a temporary stunning that can happen with people as well, um, where not related to the vitamin deficiency reversible component, but um, people who have an alcohol related dementia who are able to abstain uh, or limit their intake may actually have a significant improvement in their cognitive capacity that may take, you know, three to six months. Um, so I'm hopeful for people that have this disorder that they, they will actually improve if we can get the alcohol use down. We, we do see that with a few of the other substances that linger in the brain for some time or their effects linger inside brain cells. So uh, if people have substance use issues with opioids or benzodiazepines or even cannabis, sometimes if you uh, abstain and allow the brain long enough for, you know, some of those effects, they, there may still be reversibility with some of those other uh, substance-induced cognitive issues. So um, again, we'll, just going back to this list, I think toxic effect of alcohol on the brain uh, structures and function. We're going to talk about the thiamine deficiency in a minute in, in more detail, because I think that's a really important one. And as you alluded to, we see people with alcohol-related cognitive impairments in the um, presenting to the emergency departments or requiring admission. And we're going to talk about sort of the acute uh, sign of thiamine deficiency or a Wernicke's encephalopathy in a minute, because it's such an important one for people to recognize and get uh, emergent help for. Um, the other things that we talked about, the, the secondary effects on the liver. So people with heavy use of alcohol may uh, damage their liver, uh, conditions like cirrhosis that represent more permanent liver damage. And there are important ways in which th uh, the liver is involved in so many functions, but people can have confusion or encephalopathy related to liver disease. Do you want to say a little bit about, about that? Um, yeah, um, you know, the liver is important. Uh, it does so many things for our body, as you were 
<clears throat> describing there, one of its major functions is metabolizing proteins efficiently and fats and uh, making sure that they're sorted and packaged in the appropriate uh, fashion and cleared from your blood. And if your liver doesn't work in clearing some of those proteins, we think, because we don't know exactly what causes uh, um, hepatic encephalopathy or uh, encephalopathy related to cirrhosis, but we think that the accumulation of these proteins or amino acids start impacting the brain and can cause problems with sleep, can cause uh, confusion and confusion. Depressed, le depressed level of consciousness as well. Sometimes people can become quite stuporous or even uh, be put into a coma if it's yeah. severe enough and it's quite readily treated, uh, treatable and uh, reversible in most cases. The, um, the other component that we see if people are getting a lot of their calories from alcohol, uh, they tend not to eat other nutritious foods. So uh, generalized malnutrition and deconditioning and other types of vitamin deficiencies, as you mentioned, uh, may also be a, a, a factor in alcohol related cognitive impairments. Um, we will sometimes see people in both intoxication and withdrawal, whether or not those things are entirely reversible. We certainly see misadventure related to both of those factors. So, uh, you know, the final thing on this list of, you know, increased risk of stroke is one thing, but the increased risk of head injury, I think is a really important one. So as you talked about, the alcohol is also affecting other nerves. It's causing uh, changes to the cerebellum, which is involved in coordination and balance. So people with um, alcohol related nerve issues often have problems with balance, but when they're intoxicated, they also may show poor judgment. They may have issues with coordination. If they've also had some brain shrinkage already from the direct effects of the alcohol, there is set up for uh, brain injuries, different kinds of um, uh, hemorrhages that occur. Uh, uh, people will slip, fall, hit their heads, or their brain is more uh, vulnerable to shearing stresses that happen. And they may have other kinds of hemorrhages from uh, injuries that we wouldn't normally associate with being hard enough to cause uh, a bleed. So all of those factors may come together to make the person with, um, you know, alcohol use disorder really vulnerable to uh, brain damage from a range of different things. In addition to the direct toxic effects of the alcohol, um, uh, we, we will sometimes see people who are passed out for a long period of time, maybe under um, climate conditions that cause damage, either extreme heat and heat stroke uh, that may damage things or hypothermia where they may lose uh, consciousness and be out in the snow. And some of those things may also contribute to other forms of um, brain damage or compromise to other tissues. So a lot of different factors going on. Uh, and obviously every, every person's gonna have a different experience of it. Um, let's, let's do a little, I mean, I think this is probably an issue that is under recognized. I was not really able to find really good statistics at a population level. And I think you, you see these large ranges, you know, the, this older study from 2006 was kind of interesting though, that, you know, there's a pretty reasonable percentage of people who have dementia who may also still be consuming, uh, you know, high quantities of alcohol. And then you also of sort of 10 to 23% of people with a older adults with an alcohol use disorder have had, may have some diagnosis, another cause of dementia, like Alzheimer's disease. So I think, you know, the problem is probably under recognized, um, you know, you and I see quite a few people in the hospital setting with alcohol use disorder and and cognitive impairments, but I think it might be one of those things that's also underestimated in the community. Maybe the person's given a diagnosis of a different cause of dementia without appreciating that there may be a component of alcohol-related cognitive impairment. And studies that have been done looking at uh, what we'll talk about next with the thiamine deficiency show that there's probably a much higher percentage of people with some form of uh, serious thiamine deficiency that may not have been accurately diagnosed in the community. So I, I, I think the problem is 
maybe bigger than is documented and it it hasn't been easy to document exactly i don't know if you have any comments on on uh, some of the population based stats of how how big the issue is no i um i definitely concur with uh, kind of what you're saying in terms of an underestimated problem um it comes back to i think one of the issues you raised was was getting an appropriate history of alcohol intake and kind of what's normal uh, for people uh, in their cultural context. It's like, oh, I have two drinks a day. But when you actually ask them, it's like, well, I pour this much rum in and a splash of Coke. And so really, you know, a standard drink is one and a half ounces and they're drinking, you know, eight or nine ounces in two drinks. Um, and that's quite a lot, right? And um, even older women who should be drinking much less than that uh, will be reporting that alcohol use but if you didn't take the time to take an appropriate history and get collateral from the family members in terms of what a problem it is, then you, you won't find, uh, you won't be searching for that problem on a surface yeah. level. Yeah, no, I think it's a great point. If we, if we do have time, we, we, we have a few questions coming in that I want to get to in a minute, but if we have time, maybe we can talk a little bit more about uh, what constitutes a standard drink and, and sort of low risk drinking guidelines and guidelines for older adults. So um, I, I just want to go back, you know, we, we talked about the, the signs and symptoms of alcohol related dementia. Well, they overlap with the general features of dementia, which we've talked about and are covered in some of the lessons related to, you know, generally impairments in cognitive functions, such as memory and language and thinking skills like executive function, where you're planning, uh, visual spatial ability. So those are all the general cognitive functions. And in, in dementia, they're impaired to the point that the individual can't function uh, independently uh, anymore. So are there any specific components, keeping in mind that there's a lot of variability, but are there any um, specific components are, that are, I guess, more specific to alcohol-related cognitive impairments. You mentioned a couple. I've, I've jotted down the, some of the, the prevalence of some psychiatric symptoms, especially, especially if the person's having uh, in recurrent periods of intoxication and withdrawal. They may have um, hallucinations more commonly than some of the other uh, dementias. Any, anything else that you, you wanted to highlight in terms of um, signs and symptoms that might be more commonly seen with alcohol related dementia? Um, it's a, it's a bit of a challenge just because it's more of a white matter subcortical disease, uh, pathologically, it's more in the executive function problem generally. But as you're saying, when you have potentially head trauma or slurring of your speech related to intoxication, it's really challenging. So I think it's most important to test and examine people um, when they've abstained, obviously, and they're not intoxicated. And then sometimes it's a, a bit of a rule out where they present with these cognitive problems. It doesn't have a strong flavor of Alzheimer's disease or a strong flavor of dementia with Lewy bodies or behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia in the context of heavy alcohol intake over a period of time. Then you're like, well, this is a pure alcohol related problem mm -hmm. based on the cognitive things that they have. And then if they have significant alcohol consumption and they have a strong flavor of, let's say, Alzheimer's disease, then you might say they have a mixed dementia related to alcohol and Alzheimer. So it's not one of the more specific stories other than that kind of subcortical problems people may, may have. So um, I do want to um, finish off with a bit of a, a deep dive here, just talking about the the. Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. These were, uh, it's like two different conditions, the Wernicke encephalopathy. And then if that's not treated or managed, it can go on to develop uh, a more permanent Korsakoff syndrome. Do you want to, do you want to just walk through that a little bit? And, you know, again, I think it's so important for people to recognize the signs and symptoms of Wernicke encephalopathy so that it can be um, emergently treated so that it does not go on to um, a full-blown Korsakoff amnesia. So let's maybe just walk through that again. I know you mentioned it earlier, but I, I do think it's really important. It's it's really one of the causes of alcohol-related brain damage. And I would say 
maybe about half or more of the people we might see with an alcohol-related dementia diagnosis have m- most likely developed this sort of permanent form of this Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, so you mentioned the kind of triad of symptoms where people will have acute uh, confusion, challenges with uh, ataxia, which is unsteadiness or coordination. People might do finger to nose testing and they won't be able to find a target in space. It might be falling over as well. Uh, And then ophthalmoplegia. And what that means is paralysis of one of the eye movements. And so usually it's a sixth nerve, cranial nerve palsy. Uh, where people won't be able to move their eye laterally or something called nystagmus, which as I mentioned is instead of a smooth uh, following of uh, a stimulus with uh, the eye, uh, there'll be more kind of bouncing movements of with the eye. And so um, this, this could be just related to really severe alcohol use or intoxication, but because there could be this reversible component where you administer thymine intravenously at higher doses to overcome the deficiency and potentially reverse this. Um, We used to treat with kind of lower doses over a period, like hundred milligrams over the course of uh, five days or so intravenously. And now we're more in the one to one and a half grams per day for five to seven days. And it's not high quality evidence, but you know, there is some lower quality observational data, like non randomized control trials that suggest that treating with these higher doses does give you a, higher likelihood to uh, resolve your symptoms and obviously avoid this more permanent form, which is the Korsakoff amnesia or Korsakoff syndrome, where your inability to, to make new memories. Um, we, we talked about the anterior grade amnesia, so that's new memories you cannot make. And then confabulation where, you know, somebody will be telling a story about something that happened to them last week and you talk to their family members and they say, there's no way that this could have happened. And Or they say, oh, I've met you before, Uh, you know, you're from so-and-so, you're, you know, we're talking about this and talking about that. And you're like, well, I clearly have not met you before. And it's not, uh, it's just a very, it's matter of fact in some ways. They totally believe that what they're saying is true. They're not trying to lie to you. It's it's really the brain trying to piece together a story that makes sense uh, in some ways, but those components never happened, but it's making sense at the time. I, I will say, you know, we we see quite a few people, you know, maybe several per month with uh, Wernicke's presenting to the emergency department. I had uh, uh, a person recently who did not have any uh, like alcohol, did not have a dementia per se, but did arrive in a very confused state with all of the classic findings was put on intravenous high dose thiamine, had a dramatic improvement within a day, continued on the high dose regimen because continued to improve. Um, he, he was not able to absorb thiamine that well. He was discharged on oral thiamine, but uh, became confused again within a, a short period of time after discharge. So uh, there may be a role for high dose oral in the community after the acute thiamine deficiency is treated with higher dose um, intravenous. But, you know, for some people, probably the the combination of abstaining with alcohol because alcohol interferes with thiamine and maybe even considering replacement, like some people might require high dose oral and maybe the occasional intramuscular injection if they're not able to absorb it. But um, not restarting alcohol because of the way it interferes with thiamine is really important. So. Yeah, I think that's the other part of it too, is people that are at risk that you know are not looking to abstain anytime soon or yeah. we're in the process of arranging addictions care for them, like high quality intervention from an addiction specialist. You know, well, I'll put them on higher doses of, of thiamine orally in, until that time, even if they don't have signs or symptoms of Wernicke's yet, trying to prevent them from uh, from developing it, obviously. And you know, I think there's the, a guideline is uh, Canadian Coalition on Seniors Mental Health says like kind of 50 milligrams a day, but that doesn't really seem high enough. 
for me. So yeah, we, we tended to recommend 500 three times a day through the IV, at least for that acute period. And then, uh, with this, uh, this person who was discharged on high dose oral because we're the concerns about their current state and vulnerability and, uh, and absorption, uh, we recommended, uh, 1500 milligrams oral per day. So, um, yeah. Um, let's get to some of our, our viewer questions that have come in. And um, as always, there are some questions that are uh, more specific to today's topic. I'm going to try to take those first. And if we have time, there are some more general questions around uh, dementia. And we'll, we'll maybe tackle those uh, after covering the ones related to alcohol. So um, how much can alcohol impact incidence of young onset dementia? I'm just I mean, I guess, in. yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess what I would say in terms of, you know, th- there is a risk for people who start drinking heavily at a young age that they may experience the onset of dementia at a, at a younger age, though I believe the range of, you know, typical range of age of onset in alcohol related dementia remains about 50 to 70. So even if somebody has been a heavy drinker, um, while some people might be at the younger uh, age of onset, um, they wouldn't necessarily be, you know, having onset at, you know, 30 or 40, something like that. I, I don't know. Do you have any comments about about this, I guess the other issue is if somebody had another risk factor for a young onset dementia from another mm. cause and they were a heavy drinker, it could be that mixed picture or the alcohol is certainly not improving uh, the, the situation. I think I think it's a, a great point. And it's it's usually the interaction of that kind of genetic predisposition and then the exposures, which in this case are alcohol. And then uh, the association of kind of your regular tissue degeneration with aging that we all experience, um, as well as the development of other comorbidities. So, you know, if you ha- were hypertensive and diabetic and you had insults to your brain that way and you had microvascular disease, as well as heavy alcohol consumption, as well as a genetic predisposition, then it kind of you know, all, they all come together and probably push, yeah. push you to accumulate it uh, or to develop it earlier. But I agree 50 to 70 is kind of the, the general age that we're seeing. So this is a, this is a really good question that does get a little bit to our uh, issue of standard drinks and low risk drinking guidelines. What's considered heavy drinking versus moderate uh, drinking. And I'm going to say this also depends a little bit on your age, and uh, why, why don't we move to our 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 couple of slides here? On um, so when we talk about uh, drinking in medical terms, we also try to define it in, in terms of your number of drinks per day per week. And so the concept of a standard drink is really important. That's basically a can or a bottle of beer, a five ounce glass of wine an ounce and a half of a hard liquor. And, um, you know, that that's a standard drink. So again, when we're talking about trying to get a history of how much is somebody drinking, it's important to make sure we're talking in the same language because some people will free pour and they might say, well, I just, you know, I just have a nightcap before bed. I just have, you know, a whiskey. And it's like, well, how how much is in that whiskey? Are you measuring it? Um, you know, a bottle of beer is easier to quantify, but if people are free pouring and not measuring their glasses of wine or other things, it can be hard to know. So for, for the purposes of what constitutes sort of, you know, the low risk drinking guides, it's those things that we're talking about in terms of drink. So, you know, 10 drinks a week for women, 15 drinks for men. These are not for older adults. These are the general low risk drinking guidelines. And there should be some, you know, no more than two drinks a day, most days for women, no more than three uh, for men. And you should have non-drinking days as well. And, and, you know, for people who, who don't drink, you know, so, so is there, what, what would be moderate? I mean, these would be, if you're at the higher end of the low risk drinking guidelines, you're probably in the moderate range. If you're over that, you're in the heavy drinking range, you're sort of in an at risk drinking. Um, 
for older adults, do you want to comment a little bit about the the older adult drinking yeah. guidelines? They're a little different. I think you mentioned earlier. So. Yeah. So, I mean, it's about half for, for men. So about seven drinks per week. And again, not trying to get over two in any one sitting with the non-drinking days, trying to keep it one or less most days. And then for women, it's less than five. Again, trying to keep it less than than one and maintaining those non-drinking days. And again, this has to be personalized a bit in terms of the medications people are on as well. So if they're on sleeping pills or they're on other yeah. anti-seizure medications or anything, you you should probably be on no alcohol, right? That's right. Uh, pregnancy yeah. is yeah. another, uh, yeah. if you're yeah. younger than a certain age, uh, you know, there, there are all these other caveats around, um, you know, there's, there's never not a risk, uh, but those are generally speaking sort of low risk guidelines and low risk guidelines for older adults. So if you're above that, you're kind of in an at risk, dr- at risk or heavy drinking. There's been other definitions previously of heavy drinking. I think it was, uh, like 28 drinks per week for women and 35 per week for men was an older categorization for, you know, this is heavy drinking, but most people would say if it's above the low risk drinking guidelines, then, you know, you're, you're in a, in an at risk uh, kind of situation. Um, Good question. What about, uh, here's another question. What about tolerance? I'm curious about someone who may be able to drink four beers or other drink, for example, and feel fine versus someone who drinks one drink and feels the effects more. Will they both share equal risk of dementia to the long-term effects of alcohol consumption? So that's a really good question. Um, What I would say is the person who uh, drinks heavily and has developed tolerance is still at much higher risk of alcohol related cognitive uh, effects. So they're, they've developed tolerance because of their heavy drinking, but it's not necessarily tolerance to the toxic effects of alcohol longer term on the structures or function of the brain. Uh, so I think what the data would suggest is just because the person developed tolerance because they've been drinking you know, more and more regularly, that does not protect them in any way from future alcohol related brain damage. So the person who, you know, hasn't developed tolerance and has effects of alcohol intoxication on one drink is not going to be at increased risk of uh, brain damage from the alcohol. I don't know if you, if you have any, anything else to add to that, Rich. I think it makes sense. It's kind of, kind of like frostbite. Like there, there's a period where people don't feel like anything bad is happening, but that's the worst, worst part. So yeah, just because you don't feel anything doesn't mean that the toxic effects of the alcohol aren't happening. Another question. If a, if a person with alcohol use disorder has been sober for 30 plus years, uh, can his dementia still be linked to it? I'd say probably not. You know, there's no definitive way. Uh, I don't think there's been a great scientific study on that, but I would I would suggest that uh, probably not in that situation. You would have expected the impacts to happen earlier on in life. But yeah, there was um, you know one of the sort of proposed classification systems from years ago said there really needed to be um, a time linkage of no more than three years between the heavy drinking and the onset of dementia. Now that classification, it's not covered within, uh, the current classification systems that we use for, you know, the alcohol related dementia, but, uh, you know, I think there might, it, it's possible if somebody, you know, sustained brain damage that could be a contributor, but it's much less likely to be an issue. And so I would say, you know, I agree with you on that one, uh, much less likely. Um, According to Google Trends, searches for alcoholic dementia, in quotes, went up dramatically in August 2021. Have you or your colleagues been seeing more cases or possible cases in recent months? Alternatively, another measure is that searches for this are up 160% over the past 12 months in Canada. Well, that is pretty fascinating. I wasn't aware of it. Um, I do wonder whether or not it's related in part to increased drinking during the pandemic. And maybe people have become more aware or concerned about um, their own increased drinking or 
the, you know, increased drinking within their family. I, I don't have a great explanation for why this is trending. Um, I know Rich is very popular and these live events are too, but I don't think we're hitting Google trends just yet. But uh, I don't know. Any thoughts about that? I I, I do wonder if there is an, an element of this related to, to the pandemic and increased alcohol consumption. I, I, I think it's actually an underappreciated uh, diagnosis, or at least there's, there's a, a under diagnosis, under recognition of, of alcohol related uh, dementia and other cognitive impairments. Your, your thoughts, Rich? I haven't really seen an increase in alcohol specific related dementias, but cer- certainly there's been a number of people, uh, like a good number of people that have come in that have had their cognitive problems start at you know, March or April 2020, which is quite interesting. interesting. It also seems to correspond, though, with the social isolation that takes place, um, increased with, with the pandemic, increased sedentary lifestyle, so people aren't getting out, being active, um, and then and possibly alcohol. But usually we pick up on the fact that the alcohol had been increased or the alcohol consumption had been increased. So I just wonder if there's an increase in cognitive complaints or problems. Mm. And, you know, people are more concerned about their their alcohol consumption, but it's it's more the pandemic that just drove the cognitive concerns with respect to the first two things that were taking place. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure. It's not a great. Uh, yeah, it's, pretty, it's it's an interesting phenomenon. So I want to thank the uh, viewer for submitting that. Yeah. Um, there's here's a couple of uh, related items. I would say, uh, what about the casual drinker? who just likes to drink a glass of wine daily. Uh, Also, what about someone who drank more in their early years, but abstained after age 65? Is the damage already done early on? And then there's another, um, the the other question that relates to the low risk guidelines about what is quantity for one drink of sherry. And, um, but let's go, let's go back. I think the sherry uh, does qualify as uh, distilled alcohol, but I'll double check. There, there might be a category specific for like fortified wine, but I mm-hmm. think it's an ounce, it, it's an ounce and a half, or it might be higher because I think the alcohol content in sherry is a little lower than rye gin rum. So we'll mm-hmm. maybe we'll, we'll ask somebody to, to research that and let me know about what, what constitutes a standard drink for uh, sherry. But um, back to the other item, Casual drinker who just likes to drink a glass of wine daily. I think you highlighted that it's it's probably fine, though there are going to be some people who might even be vulnerable to, um, one, they might have a very large glass of wine that's more than one standard drink, but also there's going to be people who, for whatever reason, underlying medical conditions, vulnerability, uh, they're on other medications that might interact with the alcohol where even the one glass of wine may not be a great idea. But for many people, one standard drink is probably going to be fine unless you are really vulnerable to it. So um, any other comments about that? I guess the other point was, what if they had more but abstained after age 65? Is the damage already done? Do you want to just comment on that? I no, I think I think back to what you're saying is that it's highly personalized and it will kind of depend on the underlying genetics of that person. There's some people that drink and smoke heavily into their 90s and you know are and and don't develop dementia. So, you know, we don't mean to scare everybody with this topic and say, oh, any alcohol is bad. There are far more people that drink alcohol on a regular basis that don't develop any alcohol-related cognitive disorders. However, we do want people to be mindful of the fact that. You know, this can happen. And so if you've stopped and are leading a healthy lifestyle and are trying to exercise and doing our other brain health activities that we've described, then, you know, you can mitigate a lot of that risk. So um, it depends on your other lifestyle factors. And if you're not engaging in those healthy brain lifestyle factors, then I would say start doing them now. And, there, and there's ways in which it's happened in the past, right? Yeah. You got to always think forward and, uh, and, and move and, forward. And as we talked about before, you know, odds are that if you were drinking remotely, unless it was really severe and you maybe sustained some other type of brain injury right. related to the alcohol, odds are you, if you've abstained for a while, then, you know, the, some of those changes may be reversible. It really does depend on each context and case. And there might also be other compelling reasons why you shouldn't 
you know, continued having even a glass of wine, like the alcohol also can uh, increase your risk of certain cancers and things like that. So mm-hmm. um, uh, I want to thank our research coordinator, Stephanie, for sending in the answer to the uh, the sherry. So fortified wines such as sherry or port are actually stronger, uh, 17% alcohol, uh, a standard drink uh, is three to four fluid ounces. So I guess they're Uh, stronger than wine, but less strong than uh, hard alcohol or distilled. So they're, they're in a middle category. So three to four ounces for sherry constitutes a standard drink, Uh, 1.5 ounce for uh, gin or rye, uh, sort of a hard liquor, and then one five ounce glass for regular wine. Um, Comment about confabulation here. We just have time for maybe one or two others and we'll wrap up. Confabulation can be very complicated to identify. I had a client in the community that was so good at confabulating that it took a team of four people to recognize what was going on. Is there a standardized test for this? Um, I'm, I'm not aware of a standardized test for confabulation. And it's interesting. Most of the cases that I've been involved in do tend to be Um, relatively straightforward to identify, especially because if they involve the examiner, as you said, you go to meet somebody for the first time and you ask them, do you remember me? And they have an elaborate story about, you know, how we went to high school together or whatever. Those are some of the more obvious ones. I'm sure there are more subtle ones, especially if somebody has like details that are really hard to confirm. They, you know, claim to have come from a certain area or participated in a certain event or had a certain career that might be, you know, challenging to corroborate. If there's no uh, family member that can kind of immediately sort of say, well, that, that never happened. So I, I do understand that there might be some that are more challenging. Any, any thoughts on standardized approaches to it? Yes. Yeah, so no standardized approach that I'm aware of. The two situations where we tend to run into problems or challenges are people that might have interesting personalities, let's say, that have kind of magical thoughts about what they're able to do with their lives or they overemphasize or exaggerate their own accomplishments. And so people, the medical professionals would be like, these stories sound crazy. Like what's happening is person's confabulating, but they're actually not. They're just embellishments based on a personality trait. And then the other one is people living alone in an apartment with limited family or limited contacts where you can't actually verify where kind of what you were saying, right? So um, in those situations, talking to their neighbors, looking for any form of collateral history that you can to document the objective nature of the claims that they're making. And oftentimes you can, if you look hard enough and will call enough people around and let's say the apartment, you'll be able to get to the bottom of of this story. So the collateral is very key, which is probably why it took four people to to come up with the answer in that place. Cause you need multiple points to verify the actual truth when you don't have eyes on the ground, like a family member or a friend. Yeah. Um, so here's a couple of questions. There's just two I want to do that, um, uh, had non alcohol related. So is it, is it true? You cannot cure dementia. You just have to learn to live with it. Um, What I would say is it's important. I would do our e-learning lesson on uh, what is dementia and the causes of dementia. They're two different lessons because, you know, there are certain causes of dementia, like vascular dementia, where there are things that you can do to improve your blood vessel health as a general statement for most of the degenerative conditions. There is not a cure, but there are some you know, management strategies for some of the causes of dementia and then some of the things that we talked about related to promoting brain health. Uh, uh, So you can, I guess, be more proactive than just learning to live with it. Um, But I don't know, any other comments uh, about that? That's a perfect answer. And then um, the final question uh, was, uh, where there are impacts in the brain that bring on dementia, when can this start? age-wise? And I guess this is another uh, question where um, the changes may start at a younger age, especially in somebody who has like a very high genetic risk or a family history with young onset. And again, certain uh, 
uh, causes of dementia, especially some of maybe some of the more rare uh, causes, uh, like a Huntington disease, for example, where those brain changes might start at a much younger age than, say, somebody who, um, you know, is diagnosed with an Alzheimer dementia in their 70s, where those changes may have occurred earlier, but not necessarily at a young age. So I guess the answer is it, it really does depend. I don't know if you have any other comments about that, Rich. So. No, just that, uh, I mean, that, that the changes that are happening biologically are start to happen before people present with the cognitive problems. So, you know, there'll be problems with the synapses where the nerve cells are connecting. Um, you can pick up on poor metabolism in various areas of the brain. We talked about that in our imaging, but you'll be able to see metabolism changes with respect to glucose before people will present with cognitive complaints. So it can happen many years before people present, but that date or that uh, point in the spectrum of life is, is really variable as you say. Okay. One final question that got snuck in there uh, that uh, you're probably in the best position to answer, Rich. Uh, is there a standardized behavior checklist used for tracking changes in individuals with dementia? Uh, there are, a, there are a few, one from a, like a research point of view is called the neuropsychiatric inventory, which is very comprehensive and tracks, you know, anxiety, depression, hallucinations, and all of those things. Um, from a behavior point of view, we do have some behavior checklists uh, that, uh, that we do use in particular in hospital or long-term care settings where people observe, are observed over time and it will talk, you know, we'll discuss explicitly, are they, you know, pacing? Are they up to the nursing station? Are they awake all night? Are they aggressive, competitive? Are they pulling at things and stuff? So definitely standardized checklists there exist. Yeah, the, there was a general one known as the, the DOS, the Dementia Observation System. And our uh, friends and colleagues at Behavioral Supports Ontario also developed their own uh, uh, sort of customized version of that known as the BSO DOS, the Dementia Observation System, and, and that is available through uh, the Brain Exchange website. So that's not a, uh, I think that the DOS, the Dementia Observation System, but again, that's really used more at an institutional level rather than an individual system, but there's no reason why an individual care partner might not use something like that if they were tracking, you know, maybe they were implementing uh, uh, some behavioral strategies at home, and they might use that. Um, I think often if there is a behavioral supports team working with a family, they might suggest uh, some other type of system or checklist, maybe a little less formal uh, than some of those. I don't know if... Uh, I think that that's probably a good counsel. So um, I just want to thank you again, uh, Dr. Richard Stramko, for a great conversation about uh, an important and perhaps under-recognized issue, the alcohol-related dementia and other cognitive changes. Um, iGerry Care was developed with support uh, from many, including the Canadian Centre for Aging and Brain Health Innovation, or CABI, which is powered by Baycrest. The Jera Center at Hamilton Health Sciences, uh, McMaster University, the Hamilton Health Sciences Foundation, uh, the Alzheimer Society Foundation uh, for Hamilton Halton, and our uh, Division of E-Learning Innovation, including uh, research coordinators that send in uh, standard drinks for sherry and other things. Uh, a reminder to donate. So in the top right corner of our igericare.ca website is the big fat donate button. And that's what helps us to continue providing uh, live events. Our next live event is scheduled for Thursday, November 18th uh, at one o'clock Eastern. And I'll have uh, guest Bernice Downey talking more about Indigenous perspectives on dementia and caregiving. Uh, there's a survey as well pinned at the top of the comments section. We always look forward to your feedback and suggestions about topics for future live events. And uh, again, teamwork makes the dream work. So thanks team. And thanks again, uh, Richard, for uh, a great conversation today. Thank you. We'll see you in November.